I was born in San Diego, California, in a little town outside of San Diego called Crest. I had a brother and a sister. I was the youngest. As a kid, I was always super, super hyper, always gung-ho about anything that I was doing. Uh, I remember one of my friends telling me that she liked me because I loved everything. I wanted to be Joan Embry. <laughs> I wanted to be a zoologist for the longest time. When we moved into that house, I started getting interested in dance and gymnastics. Um, and gymnastics at that point pretty much became my life. I had an abusive father. Um, and when I was six, my mother had finally had enough and she left, and she took us with her, thank God. Um, but you know, this is, this is the reality of it. This is where Kimpin and Hoenn is the truth. You know, you're walking down the street, you're walking down the blade, and you're seeing, you know, either girls working or you're seeing, you know, pimps hustling, trying to, you know, get girls in their stable. Um, and that's it, you know, you, just, you gotta, I guess, see the reality of it. Just as far as like, okay, there's a lot of things that happen out there. A lot of like abuse, a lot of, you know, like violence. Um, I had numerous things happen to me out there that it just started to like kind of take a toll. You know, there were just like numerous things that, that happened out there that, um, kind of started to gear my mind like, one of these days I'm gonna come up dead. He had broken a beer bottle and held it up against my neck one night and started yelling at me and calling me names and he asked me to leave. And I didn't have anywhere to go. And that's where people get confused about this is her choice because he asked me to leave and I really did not, at 12 years old, I had nowhere to go. I remember getting out walking up to the front of the hotel over here. And I remember it going through my head, you know, once he said, you do realize what an escort is, right? You're, you came here to give me sex. I'm gonna pay you for it, you know? How much do you charge? But everything kinda, I guess, that was it. That I was no longer a person, I was a hoe. And once you've turned that one trick, you're, there's, really no reason to stop. I mean, you're nothing but a hoe, and you've basically sold yourself to another human being, um, and your pimp pretty much owns you. I mean, who can you go back to after you've done that? If we think about indoctrination as kind of what we see in cults um, and kind of that process of initial love bombing and, and you feel like your needs are being taken care of or, or somebody's speaking to the, the needs that you feel like haven't been addressed, um, but very soon they, they develop a dependence upon the person um, and then once that person has a level of kind of you've developed some dependence, the manipulation starts and so that manipulation can take various forms. A lot of times it's about isolation so that you can't see your friends and your family anymore. The violence often begins, and, and violence again can take many, many forms. Sometimes it's experiencing physical violence, sometimes it's witnessing violence happening to other girls, um, and that can be just as frightening because you know that that may end up happening to you if you don't behave. 
These, and these pimps are convincing these girls to get involved. They're victimizing them, they're forcing them, they're beating them. Uh, we had a couple cases where they were kidnapped and, um, and they were actually brought to San Diego with the intention of kind of coming down to San Diego to party, but what the girls hadn't realized was that the guys had arranged to trade them for drugs. I think people would be shocked to understand that uh, teenagers, preteens, young boys and girls are falling prey in places where you wouldn't suspect would be dangerous. Uh, the malls, the beach, places where, where young people hang out, they're subject to um, recruiting or being uh, talked to by people that may come across as innocent but are really trying to work towards involving them in prostitution. The whole time he's recruiting your daughter because he sees her, he thinks she's pretty, he's going to have her meet her at the mall. This all transpired over Facebook and then uh, she ends up running away with the pimp and not knowing the entire time that's what he was looking for. Uh, he wasn't looking to be her friend, he was looking to put her on the street. Frequently with young girls, the approach is to start buying them things, to start giving them things they may not be getting. So uh, paying to, for them to have their nails done, buying them clothes, you know, really kind of reeling them in and making them think, this is somebody who cares about me. This is somebody who loves me. This is somebody who's going to give me the kind of things that I don't have, that I'm not getting. Just that night, he had my number and he was already sending me text messages, my little princess. You know, sleep tight tonight, can't wait to see you, I'm going to dream about you tonight, uh, I feel good things about us. You, you can't really impress upon the, the pimps how damaging what they're doing is to the girls, how damaging what they're doing is to these teenagers. They don't care. It's a, a level of uh, inhumanity that most people aren't familiar with and that most people uh, can't relate to. Uh, it's just about the money for them. The pimps look at them as a way to earn money. The pimps look at them as an object to be utilized for their own good. They always hang that, you know, issue out there, oh yeah, someday we're going to get married, someday we're going to be together, but that someday never ever happens. I decided I needed to leave the life when I um, was hit over the head with a candle by one of the girls who worked for my pimp um, and realized that they had tried to kill me. But the truth of the matter is that I woke up on my condo floor in a pool of blood and realized that if I didn't leave, I was gonna end up dead. I guess maybe that was the one thing that I needed to wake me up from the dream. They're children. They don't know how to speak. They are suffocating in their pain. And it's our responsibility as adults to give them their air, to give them their space, to give them their place to breathe and a safe place. Well, uh, the hope is in a community that, um, that wants to help them. And um, we certainly do at Generate Hope, but it's not just Generate Hope. There are, there's a, a a large group of people throughout San Diego who want to make change, who want to offer support. Now I have resources, the Action Network, um, uh, Generate Hope, uh, you know, San Diego Youth Services, a whole variety of people who started working together in order to tell these girls, hey listen, I'm not going to treat you like a criminal, you are a victim in my eyes and we're going to try and get you help. You know, I was able to come out and, and of that life in many mm -hmm. parts thanks to you. Um, but I never really looked back. And so I did um, go to school. I went to Grossmont, which was a junior college. And um, from there, transferred to San Diego State and um, graduated with a degree in history. Um, Traveled to Bali, volunteered in an orphanage there, uh, came back, started with more than purpose, um, and now I, I work a full-time job. I run a nonprofit organization, and um, I have a great, healthy life. You know, um, it hasn't been easy, but I'm incredibly happy to be where I am right now. If I could say one thing to the public that did not know about what was happening, 
it would be to let them know what's happening in our community and that they have an opportunity. Better, we have an obligation to protect these children.